All right, so let's just briefly review where we were. We started this, uh, this viscosity discussion uh, or our momentum uh, transfer discussion with the fundamental law, and that is Newton's law of viscosity, which simply says, all right, I will look at the shear, uh, shear stress uh, that fluid uh, feels when, uh, when different layers are moving, uh, different layers of fluid are moving at different velocities. And I'm gonna simply say, aha, uh -huh, I have a gradient uh, in, in velocity, so this is uh, proportional, and I'm gonna, or rather with the negative sign here, and I'm gonna put in here a coefficient that we're gonna to refer to as viscosity as a coefficient of proportionality. So as I mentioned, this is from a family of the simplest laws that we like to apply, and those are the ones that basically take a linear or create a linear relationship. In reality, that relationship is not linear, but most of the time, it's good enough for all of our practical uh, purposes. So we're gonna, first, we set in this, before we actually start using that law in a more generalized three-dimensional sense, this is sort of a one-dimensional uh, situation, we want to actually just look a little deeper into the molecular mechanisms that actually result in this law. So first thing that we did is like, okay, well, let's observe something. If I have gases, and these are measurements, I simply took the measurements uh, from the textbook uh, in the table 112, and I plotted them, and we see that for gases and liquids, we actually have sort of opposite behavior with respect to temperature. And we'd like something fundamental, something that explains this behavior without just being uh, an observation that we take for granted. A lot of science is developed simply by observation, nothing wrong with that, but it's actually good to have some better, deeper understanding of this phenomenon. And that's where theory comes in, and sometimes simulation. So what we basically did is like we put together simplest situation of them all. Again, I have two parallel plates. Bottom one is moving at a constant velocity. The upper one is standing still. And after some time at steady state, I'm going to develop a linear profile, uh, velocity profile, or that's what we definitely observe. So when, when I actually put together a similar situation, I just go to sort of a molecular level and apply molecular theory. I basically have gases moving around. Uh, my um, kinetic theory of gases gives me certain uh, numbers that I can work with. There's an average distance between different collisions. Uh, there's an average uh, speed of every uh, molecule and they're assumed to go in all of the possible random directions. There's the frequency of uh, with, with which these molecules uh, collide with, uh, with uh, one side of a surface and so forth, and we can put those to work and essentially recover, uh, recover viscosity. So how do we do that? Well, we put gas in between two parallel plates, and for this particular derivation, which of the perspectives that we have on shear stress uh, is more useful? Is it the moment momentum one or the force perspective? Do we even recall what those were? Momentum. So our momentum perspective identifies shear stress tau yx as x momentum of particles transferred in positive y direction per unit area perpendicular to that direction. Okay. And our force perspective says that that's basically the force that in x direction that this portion of the fluid that is moving faster, in our case it's in the lesser uh, y uh, portion of the fluid, is exerting per unit area on the portion of the fluid, this red box that is moving slower. So those are two different perspectives that one can actually 
we used to explain. In this case, we're going to momentum perspective because that's essentially molecular perspective, right? I can kind of see molecules in that one. So when we did that, we pretty much counted up the X momenta or summa, summa, summed up all of the momenta of molecules that are moving in positive direction. And I deducted the momenta of the molecules moving in uh, Y direction. And basically, the only other formula that I need is Taylor's formula to approximate my velocity to the first order. So I'm using only the first derivative term. And once I put that in, we indeed get a formula that looks like something like this. So my tau yx is some expression, and this expression really just depends only on the gas itself, not velocity, and times dvx dy. So this indeed appears to be this coefficient of proportionality or viscosity that Newton was talking about. Okay. Now Newton came from the our room situation, like just observing things in the lab. Okay. Whereas this is actually bottom up from the molecular perspective. Okay. So the two meet, and this is the strength. Uh, this is the strength of different scientific approaches coming together. Is everything perfect? No. This is actually a very simplistic view. View in which I have actually just molecules bouncing around like tennis balls. Okay. It's very simplistic, but it does allow me to compute everything. I can. Uh, I can come up with those average speed, average velocity, and so forth, those formulas come by easily when I don't have or don't account for intermolecular forces. So this was basically, I get the formula where I have that my mu, once I put out all of the numbers, I have an expression for lambda, I have an expression for uh, average speed, uh, and so forth. So when I put all of those in, I get that my viscosity is something like this. So indeed, it depends on temperature. Okay, There's square root of temperature here. This is Boltzmann constant, mass of the molecules, diameter, and the rest are just, um, well, we know what P is. Okay, So I indeed, at least from the outside of it, I can actually see, aha, uh -huh, for gases, my viscosity indeed increases with the increase in temperature. Okay. That is unlike liquids, but that explain, uh, explains at least qualitatively what we saw in that first picture. All right. So this indeed uh, confirms the empirical observations, at least quantitatively. An interesting thing is that I have only dependence on temperature though pressure and temperature are interrelated. In this case, my PV is equal to NRT, right? This is the ideal uh, gas situation. But I don't have explicit dependence on pressure in there, though I could explain. So based on this, just to kind of remember this or <laughs> put this, uh, to strengthen this based on this kinetic theory of gases, my gas viscosity is proportional to Square root of T. So I don't expect you to remember that entire formula. If you need it, you will refer to it on your cheat sheet, your test, or or uh, or in the book. But this, what should, what you should remember is that based on this theory, you have the square root of T dependence. Okay, because that that's kind of the basic fun, uh, functional relationship we have in there. Okay, so there is an extension that actually accounts for the intermolecular forces. And that one's called chapman Enskog uh, uh, theory. And basically, what it starts with, and we're not going to derive it. I'm just going to explain kind of what it accounts for. So it takes um, intermolecular uh, forces. So I have actually here so-called Leonard-Jones potential phi plotted right here. And then my force in between two, uh, two molecules, assuming that they're the same molecules and they're at distance r, is then the negative derivative with respect to r of that potential. Okay. And I actually have a formula for this potential. 
and that's essentially what I plot in there in red. So here I take epsilon as the maximum energy of attraction between two molecules, and this sigma is so-called collision diameter. And I will observe in this potential that it's basically, it falls down, there's a critical distance here, uh, I think I call it Rn, in, or the book calls it Rn, and then after that distance, it actually starts it changes direction and starts growing from there. So when I take a derivative, the derivative here is negative, okay? and the derivative here is positive. So I have up until certain distance, okay, two molecules, when they're very close to each other, there will be a very, very strong repulsive force, okay, which is positive. So that repulsive force, and then there is a critical distance after which I actually, when I, when I get further away, there, there's attraction. And that attraction is a little weaker because I can see that the derivative here is smaller. Okay? Because my force is the derivative of the potential. So there is, again, strong uh, repulsion because that's sort of self-preservation of two molecules. Uh, if they get too close to each other, they could actually merge, right? And there is a strong repulsion against that, and then as they get further away, this force becomes attractive. So that's essentially what this is modeling. So when I actually incorporate that, we're not going into that, there is a slightly different formula that is also more, uh, more uh, accurate, and what, again, I still have this square root of T dependence, so that hasn't changed, okay? But what I will actually put in there is I have this collision diameter and this omega integral, and those I actually have to go and look up. So this is something that I actually look up, and there's a table, I believe, E, yes, table E2, uh, where I can actually look at this collision integral. So this is tabulated, and you go and use it. Okay? And this particular formula, or version of the formula, has very specific, there is a coefficient here that is very specific to the use of very specific units. Okay? So gram per centimeter second. So CG is second. Okay? All right. So let's just, this is, again, limitations are that all of these have been developed for monatomic gases, simple, relatively not polar, polar molecules, so something like um, nitrogen, helium will work really well. Okay. Now, if I have very complex molecules that are almost automatically then polar, then these, uh, the Leonard-Jones potential is not necessarily a good a uh, good model for that anymore, so that becomes more complex. Also, if I have a mixture of gases, it is a relatively simple mixture law. If I have n species, and I go alpha from 1 over to n, then this is the molar fraction, x alpha, and this is the visc viscosity of each of those uh, within, and then also I also have to come up with sort of a mixture coefficient, that depends on the molecular weights and viscosities of all of these uh, specific species that I have in there. Okay. So it's a relatively, relatively simple formula. It's with the help of, a, I wouldn't even say calculator. This requires a little bit of programming to efficiently compute. Okay. So point is that there is a formula for mixtures. Okay. Again, I don't expect you to Remember this, I just expect you to remember that for mixture of different gases, you can actually use a formula that basically takes a fraction of those gases in the mixture and their individual viscosities. Okay. Now, here's how these uh, actually work. So this is my kinetic theory prediction, which is relatively simple to derive, but not necessarily on target. Experimental data and this Chapman and Stoke theory match much better. Okay. So Chapman and Stoke theory is a better 
a better prediction and it uses, well, essentially the collision integral in there uh, is what gives it better accuracy. And then once I actually have higher pressures, okay, then none of these will, the, everything will work at low pressures. So this is theory for low pressure and low density. Okay. Once I get, start getting to very high pressures, none of these actually work. Okay. So that's something to have in mind. So this is basically for gases, and for gases the theory is relatively good and we can actually uh, explain things rather well. Uh, however, now I'd like to move to liquids. I don't have only gases, I need liquids as well. So between, when you think about differences between gases and liquids, one thing that we know is that gas expands much easily and basically gets into all of the spaces uh, and occupies them much easily. It is also much more compressible. Whereas liquids typically have this free surface that divides them from the environment and that also kind of prevents them uh, getting into all of the places. In most gases we know that they don't wet solid surfaces but liquids do. Now liquids themselves and that's basically what's creating this surface have much much stronger intermolecular force. So if you think about, there's much higher density, okay, and there's pretty much no way to calculate that there's no Leonard-Jones potential for liquids, okay. There's no way I can get some sort of analytic formula that gives me what do two molecules feel at a distance, pretty much because the way Leonard-Jones is working is that when you're calculating intermolecular force with Leonard-Jones potential, you're kind of disregarding all other molecules. You're working with two molecules that are at distance R. Okay? And all others are far away enough that they're not going to affect you in any way. There's no such thing in liquids. There's always somebody in your space in liquids. So in that sense, it's extremely hard to um, compute. And liquid molecules, they constantly go under, uh, go motion. There is a model of this, it's not a cage, we're not in solids, but we're some, somewhere in between. So you have constantly this sort of lattice or molecules moving around, and then spaces open up. Okay. And then some molecule from the neighborhood comes in to fill in that space if it's energetically favorable. Okay. And then, because that molecule moved in, there's another space that has just opened up. Okay. And then some other molecule from the neighborhood jumps in. So this just continues and goes and goes and goes. Okay. So basically, we need to model that. So let's actually, uh, so just, if, we, if you recall, this is what we did. Like we kind of placed our molecules of gas in between two parallel plates. We're going to attempt to do that now for liquids. It's just that the model is actually going to be a little... Uh, different, so I'm going to actually leave these spaces and we're going to see what it takes for the molecule to jump into that space. So this is where I'm going to switch writing and unfortunately I'm going to have to stop the video and I'm going to point you to the video from last year.